Hi, this is Paul McGuire, and you are watching a prophetic emergency alert. Wherever you're watching from or listening from on planet Earth, whether it's in the USA, the European Union, Great Britain, the Middle East, whether you're in South America, North America, Canada, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in, we are here to give you a prophetic emergency alert where we analyze current events, news, societal events, trends, etc. from what is called a biblical worldview. In other words, we understand that the Bible is not just a book of spiritual truth, although it is, but the Bible in addition to being a book of spiritual truth the Bible is a book of truth that deals with, for example, economic truth, societal truth, um, uh, governmental truth, the truth of law, history, genetic truth, biological truth, artistic truth, creative truth, prophetic truth as to what is going to happen to mankind in the future and truth in every spectrum of life. Just take creative truth of music, art, literature, and of course today it would extend into uh, electronic forms of communication. So, my name is Paul McGuire and you're watching a prophetic emergency alert. We are in a time of crisis like no other time in the history of the world. That's why I titled my last book and newest book, it's called The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And yes, indeed, we are in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of people or mankind in the history of the world. As two opposing forces, essentially, wage war inside the heart of every individual, and that would include you and me. And those two opposing forces are good versus evil. Now, another thing is that uh, we are in a time of unprecedented technological, biological, genetic, uh, space science, computer science, artificial intelligence, the singularity, and we're in a world, you know, when I was a, a kid, I was like a big uh, reader of science fiction books, especially from the, the, the science fiction, the great science fiction writers like Robert Heinlein wrote Stranger in a Strange Land, and many other classics, Isaac Asimov who wrote the iRobot series, and many others, and, and stimulating your mind as a young kid with science fiction novels, you learned how to develop a mind that could grasp, uh, from an imaginative perspective, the future of science and the future of mankind. And I also, in addition to reading lots of science fiction books, when I was a young kid, I wanted to be, I know it sounds very nerdy, but but that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a nuclear physicist and uh, or maybe an oceanographer and so I began taking out from the library all these books and I would read the biography of every great scientist in the library. I forget, it took me like two years but I read every biography of every great scientist and that included psychologists nuclear physicists, etc. Oh, and Robert Goddard, the father of American rocket scientists, uh, rocket science. And I launched my own rocket. You could buy rocket kits back then. I don't know if they're still legal. And you could buy from a place in Colorado like a two-stage rocket or a three-stage rocket. 
Now, I lived in New York City, and I kind of juiced up my rockets because I would first fire up insects in my rocket, and they would parachute down and live. But then I got a little out there and fired up uh, a rocket with a little mouse in it. Thank God the, 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 the parachute worked, and uh, uh, the, the mouse was alive. But I was, like, really into that stuff when I was a kid. And I was into transhumanism when I was 12, 11 years old, because I, I was reading all these books on science, and some of the books were written by, like, Julian Huxley, the founder of UNESCO in the United Nations, the brother of Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. And Julian Huxley was the first scientist to publicly uh, promote and use the word transhumanism. And what is transhumanism? Well, most of you know. Transhumanism is the science where you use technology, where you use uh, neurological sciences, genetic modification, DNA modification, chemicals, neural implants, biochip implants, artificial intelligence, all kinds of things you use to, to amplify the power of the ordinary man or woman. Now, the secret behind transhumanism is that whether the transhumanist scientists admit it or not, they have a, a deep, deep innate desire to play God because their goal is artificial immortality. Their goal is artificial eternal life. Their goal is to make man artificially immortal by manipulation of the DNA code and merging man or woman with machine or robotic or cyborg or android technology. Many of you have seen that movie with uh, Johnny Depp. I think it's called Transcendence. It came out a number of years ago. And Johnny Depp, he uploads his human consciousness in his brain to a computer. And then this vast global computer network, upon his orders, because he's, his consciousness is living in artificial intelligence, he begins to take over the world. And there's so many other movies that, that reflect these themes. So... Mankind is at the crossroads of a futuristic destiny that, that has never been an option for the human race before.
You know, I believe the Bible is a literal and inspired account of the history of mankind, the historical account of man's interactions with the Supreme Being, the infinite personal living God of the universe. And when you go back into Genesis in the Bible, and I don't believe that, that the Genesis count is a fairy tale or a metaphor. I believe that it's literally true. Because any thinking person, if you're doing a comparison and contrast between the Genesis account of creation, which says a supreme being with infinite intelligence, a creator, capital C, created the first man, the first woman, planet Earth, the Garden of Eden, Eden, so on and so forth, and God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them male and female, that's a very plausible, rational, logical uh, hypothesis, I believe it's the truth, for the origins of mankind. You compare it with Darwin's theory of evolution, which claims to be scientific, but there's no empirical scientific proof whatsoever to prove his theory of evolution. And his theory of evolution is really a fable. It's a mythology. And it basically says that man originated from uh, like a rock or a pebble, maybe a pebble orbiting, you know, Jupiter or something. And then after 200 to 300 million years, the pebble eventually evolved into some protoplasm, so some microscopic, you know, molecular life form. And then as hundreds of millions of years go by, it, you know, the chimpanzee to the ape to Homo sapien and man is born. The problem with that is that Darwin and none of the evolutionary scientists have any empirical scientific evidence to prove the theory of evolution. So, for example, uh, they have approximately 70 million uh, um, fossils that they have saved and analyzed, fossil records. And out of these 70 million fossil records, they don't have one single fossil record which shows that all important missing link between man, as we are today, or woman, and, and that, that crossover species. Like, like, where's the evidence of man and then the genetic evidence of a man-ape, where there's the DNA of both man and ape there, there, there's, they call it the missing link. There's, there's no fossil record that, that shows the missing link. And we're expected to believe it just magically happened. Now it's interesting that when you read the Bible from the perspective of a biblical worldview, when you understand that the Bible is not some fairy tale book, or as Joseph Campbell said, a book of mythologies, when you understand that the Bible is uh, literal and the inspired and errant Word of God, and the Bible is true scientifically, biologically, genetically, um, and in every area that it deals with, when you understand that and you read things like uh, the book of Genesis, it's like the, the blindness dissolves off of your eyes and you read Genesis and, you, and, and it hits you like a lightning bolt, you see in the book of Genesis that God is the creator, capital C. He creates mankind, he creates the heaven and the earth, so, so on and so forth. But God reveals to us his knowledge of DNA, his knowledge of genetics in the book of Genesis. And so when he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, that's not only a commandment from God for Adam and Eve to make babies. 
It's also a general principle. It's one of God's primary principles, the principle of being fruitful and multiplying, not just in making babies, but in any endeavor, whether it's business, entrepreneurship, um, art, technology, science. God expects his creation, mankind, to be fruitful and multiply in everything that they do. So God then reveals in the book of Genesis that when any species is being fruitful and multiplying, it always multiplies only within that particular species. So, for example, corn reproduces as corn. Corn doesn't reproduce as elephants. Men and women reproduce as men and women. Um, a, a, a apple tree reproduces as an apple tree, each according to its own kind. So, God, the Creator, capital C, has laws to his genetic code and DNA, and that is that every species is supposed to reproduce after its own kind. Now, you contrast that with Darwinian evolution, and you have a theory which says that uh, um, any species can reproduce into a completely different and other species or even higher order of species. Okay, the only problem with Darwin's theory of evolution is is that out of 70 million uh, fossil records there's not one fossil record which shows any empirical scientific evidence or proof that that has ever happened, Darwin's theory, that that one species has ever evolved into a completely different species or that a lower level species has ever evolved into a higher level different species. So, anyway you slice it, the biblical account is scientifically accurate and sound. Darwin's theory of evolution, which was really a readaptation of some of the principles of Freemasonry. Uh, in fact, a lot of Darwin's theory of evolution is borrowed Freemason from Freemasonry. The idea of man becoming God. You see, the hidden, the hidden truth behind evolutionary theory is the premise that man can evolve and become God. That's the hidden premise of Freemasonry, but it's also the hidden premise of um, Darwin's theory, theory of evolution. So, we have truth versus non-truth. We don't have, Christianity, you know, is, is targeted for destruction by both communist ideology, Marxist ideology, secular humanist ideology, and even occult ideology. Because uh, a biblical worldview clearly states that there is a Creator God, capital C, and He wants abundance on planet Earth. That's why He says, be fruitful and multiply. So let's just zero in for a moment on this uh, commandment uh, from God to all men and women to be fruitful and multiply. That, in today's environment and world, makes people very nervous because people have bought, bought in to the mythology and the myth that planet Earth, as Buckminster Fuller described it, and, and Buckminster Fuller's uh, description uh, is partially correct. He was a brilliant man. Fuller, Buckminster Fuller was a brilliant man. He invented the geodesic dome, probably the most efficient architectural st structure ever devised, and he invented many other things. Fuller came up with this concept called Spaceship Earth, and the idea was that planet Earth is like a gigantic spaceship with a limited number of natural resources, and it's a spaceship that can only comfortably house 
a certain number of people. And then if, if too many people multiply and too many people are born on spaceship Earth, we will run out of natural resources, food, fuel, and then we will self-destruct. So Buckminster Fuller, like many others, embraced this uh, idea of sustainable development, that you, you should not uh, develop or grow or multiply or build or use up resources or use up energy beyond what is sustainable. Well, that there's truth in that. I mean, a classic example would be is if you were driving your car from your house or your condo or whatever, and you didn't bother to check the gas tank, and you just had, you know, like a less than a quarter of your gas tank filled with gasoline, and you had to drive, let's say, from L.A. to San Diego and back. Well, guess what? you don't have enough gasoline in your gas tank in order for it to be sustainable. You're not going to make it with that limited amount of gasoline from San Diego back to LA. So there's truth in, in uh, being responsible regarding sustainable development. The same would be true if you were building a nation or building a community you have to put into the equation how many people versus how much energy consumption, consumption water consumption, uh, medical needs, etc., etc. So, so the idea is of sustainable development um, has its purposes. The problem is we come to a, a split in the road, which the human race is really coming to now. And this is the problem in a nutshell. The infinite personal living God of the universe, the Creator, capital C, who created Earth and mankind, is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He is not stupid. Um, he understands sustainable development etc etc so when he says, says to Adam and Eve be fruitful and multiply he knows exactly how much multiplication how many babies can be safely uh, born into spaceship earth and at what point does spaceship earth cease to be sustainable God knows that. I mean, it's like insulting to the infinite personal living God of the universe to, to do a critique of him where you assume he's an idiot. He's not an idiot. So there's a basic error in calculation concerning what is sustainable. When you see the Georgia Guidestones or you hear the discussions of, of the globalists like... Uh, uh, um, the head of the World Economic Forum. I think his name is Schwab Klaus, or Klaus Schwab, forgive me for not knowing which name comes first. But anyway, he's the head of the World Economic Forum. And he's also the author of a book, of a book called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. And he's one of the architects, he's one of the globalist architects of what is now generally known as the global reset or the great global reset and the idea is they want to make planet earth sustainable <clears throat> environmentally with energy consumption food consumption reproduction housing so on and so forth and so you have things like the united nations agenda 2030 in which they want to accomplish their goal of a green and sustainable planet. And all that is fine. You know, a proper understanding of uh, the book of Genesis, when, when God gives mankind rulership or the ability to rule and reign over planet Earth in the Garden of Eden, or 
exercising dominion over planet Earth in the Garden of Eden. The proper interpretation of God's mandate is man is not supposed to rape and plunder Mother Earth. Man and Christian man, a Christian worldview, does not um, it is not supposed to empower the raping and plundering of Mother Earth. It, it's not supposed to uh, promote the idea of of uh, carelessly using up all of our energy uh, resources or polluting the planet with uh, energy resources that uh, contaminate the air, etc. The true Christian biblical worldview regarding my relationship to Spaceship Earth, your relationship to Spaceship Earth and what is sustainable, the truly biblical and Christian worldview that is revealed in the book of Genesis is that Adam and Eve were the rulers of planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. They ruled and reigned planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. They exercised dominion over planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. Now, many Christians over the centuries have misconstrued that or misinterpreted that to mean, well, hey, you know, we rule and reign planet Earth. We uh, have dominion over planet Earth. So let's just use up every energy source. Let's just pollute the world. Let's not give any regard to polluting lakes, streams, water, etc., uh, etc. Et that viewpoint does not represent a correct biblical interpretation of the book of Genesis. That is, a, is an irresponsible viewpoint that has nothing to do with God in the Bible. When you analyze the words, for example, man and woman having dominion over planet Earth, ruling and reigning over planet Earth, the biblical definition of those words needs to be used with great precision. When you use uh, with precision the definition of those words, you arrive at the proper biblical truth regarding what God's intent for mankind is and was when he said, be fruitful and multiply. And that's this basic principle, which the world doesn't understand, or the world system, or, or the globalists, unfortunately, don't understand. When God talks about leadership, headship, he always does it within the framework of a leader is a servant leader. Jesus Christ was King of Kings and Lord of Lords, okay? The most powerful, authoritative being in the entire creation and universe. But when he came to planet Earth the first time, Jesus Christ came as a, quote, suffering servant. Jesus Christ did not come to be worshipped like a king, Jesus Christ did not come so that men could serve him. Jesus Christ came to serve mankind, to lay down his life for men and women. And that reveals God's paradigm, which is that of a servant leader. So, when you see Adam and Eve being given power, authority, dominion, ruling and reigning over planet Earth, it has to be looked at through a biblical worldview. Those definitions of rulership and dominion that we see in the book of Genesis should never be misinterpreted to mean, you know, we're the dictators, we're the kings, we're the queens of planet Earth, we have the right to rape and plunder planet Earth. No, no. The, 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 the true biblical viewpoint uh, depicts a far higher level of leadership. If you like, you could use the word 
a far higher level of consciousness regarding leadership. Because God, the infinite person, the living God of the universe, his, he's not only the creator, capital C, he is creative, but God's primary characteristic is God is love. God is love. So everything God does flows from his character as love, including the creation of man, the creation of heaven and earth, and the creation of all creation. So when we read in the book of uh, Revelation, when we look into the future, we see that those people who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are going to spend all eternity in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, that they are going to be, those that are faithful, are going to be what the Bible says are uh, servant kings, or servant queens, or priest kings, or priestess queens. Do you see the biblical paradigm? Because it's different, you know, the world has a paradigm regarding leadership. The guy who puts his foot up on the desk in the old days, he'd smoke a cigar and, and pinch the secretary in her posterior and, you know, he was totally unaccountable. The whole idea of a boss, a bureaucracy, a dictatorship, a totalitarian regime, you know, this top-down, pyramidical, top-down uh, um, dictatorship. That is not the biblical paradigm. The biblical paradigm is way beyond that in consciousness because it's birthed from eternal agape love. And God wants his people to be priest uh, kings or priestess queens. A priest or a priestess in the proper definition of the word is somebody who has been given supernatural spiritual authority but doesn't seek to be worshipped but seeks to serve, seeks to set people free, seeks to uh, facilitate healing and salvation and, and deliverance. That's the proper biblical model, that the leader is a servant. Jesus was a servant. And so the non-biblical model is seen in communism, socialism, Marxism, and in most nations of the world where the leader of a communist, socialist, Marxist nation is a dictator, or it's a police state, or, it, you know, you, you bow before us or you're killed or locked into a prison camp or whatever. That's not what the Bible teaches.